Once again, our sermon for tonight is taken from the Old Testament lesson that's on page 4 of your service folder if you'd like to follow along. Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18. The psalmist writes, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the consequences of sin are more than we could ever count, right? One action, one deed, and the effects that it has on all of mankind until the end of time. I truly believe that one of the worst and one of the hardest and harshest consequences of sin to deal with is memory loss. Many of us look forward to retirement, but I don't think any of us look forward to the days when we will lose our memory. It's all around us, isn't it? I don't know if you knew this, but every three seconds someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. Over 50 million people in the world are struggling with one of these diseases. Some of you are going through that with a friend or family member or loved one. Some of you have gone through that before and know just how difficult that is. You've seen or witnessed that struggle to want to remember something, to have that quick memory, that quick wit that you used to have to be able to remember something that happened decades ago. Yet day after day and year after year, it it becomes harder to even remember what you had for lunch. It's a difficult thing to go through. It might be equally and just as difficult to observe a family member struggling with memory loss. I came to realize that all on my own from a very young age. Uh, For as long as I can remember in pretty much all of my young life, my grandmother was in a nursing home. For as long as I was alive, that's where she was. My, my grandfather on my dad's side was already in heaven by the time that I was about one year old and my grandma wasn't long behind him. So everything that I remember of my grandma was visiting her in that nursing home. And that's what we did two times a week at the very least, sometimes more, never less. And we'd always make a stop before going and visiting grandma. We'd go and stop at the Chinese takeout place right across the street from the nursing home. Her and I would always share a, an entree, maybe an appetizer, and if I was lucky, a dessert. So one day we made a stop to that Chinese takeout restaurant and we got just what grandma ordered and we brought it into the nursing home. And I remember I was the first one in the door that day and I got to the doorway and I saw my grandma. I loved my grandma. So when I saw her, the the natural reaction I had was smile from ear to ear. It it sparked a, a sense of joy in me. I was so happy to see her. Even if it had been a day, it felt like an eternity since I saw her last And I remember I would go as fast as a little boy could run, just dead sprinting to Grandma with my arms outstretched. And Grandma would always have her arms outstretched, ready and willing to give me that big old bear hug as as hard as she could squeeze. But on that day, the closer I got and the further out my arms stretched, I realized something weird was happening. Grandma's arms weren't opening up. Grandma's arms were closing even tighter. Grandma was backing away from me and evaded my hug for the first time ever. And then it hit me. When she gave me that face that she'd never given me before, and she looked at me and said, who are you? And you can imagine how difficult that was to deal with as a a little boy. The questions going on in my mind, wondering how on earth this could be. I, I wasn't old enough, I wasn't mature enough to realize that this was the disease wreaking havoc on her mind. Even as my dad drove us home that day and was trying to explain it to us, the millions of questions going on in my brain. Grandma, how could she forget me? If There's plenty of people in this world that can forget me, even my own teacher. But my grandmother? She was there minutes after I was born, one of the very first people to hold me. She's been there day after day to watch me grow up. We visit her over twice a week. She knows who I am. She said my name thousands of times. I'm her very own flesh and blood. How could she forget me? I didn't get it, and it was tough going through that consequence of sin. With 50 million people in this world and every three seconds someone being diagnosed with that disease, I'm sure that you've gone through that too, maybe from a young age, maybe a little bit later on in life. It's not fun. But we realize that those going through memory loss have an excuse, right? They didn't bring that disease upon themselves. They don't want to be dealing with that illness. If there is anyone that wishes that they could remember more than you, it's them, right? They don't want to be going through this. The fear and the helplessness as they're going through this disease, they don't want it. They don't want to be struggling and to go through this. 
So they have an excuse. They absolutely do. But the Israelites did not. The Israelites were without any kind of an excuse. It wasn't mere minutes, it seems, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, after God had delivered them from the Egyptians, that they are out in the wilderness, and what are they doing? Remembering all the great things that God had done, worshiping and praising His holy name, It should have been the only thing that was on their brain and in their heart, the things that God had done, the lengths that he would go through to deliver them from this land. And yet what happens? Some 98 degree days, a little bit of scorching sun, going without a little bit of water and some food, and what do they do? Curse God's name. Grumble and complain. Man, if if only we could go back to Egypt as long as we had some food and water there. God's brought us out into the wilderness to die erecting up false idols to worship without any kind of excuse. There should have been no memory loss whatsoever. But God knows his people. God knows the state of sinful humankind. God knows how quick and easy it is, not just for the Israelites, but for all of us to be faithless and forgetful. And for that reason, he instituted the Passover meal. He instituted this celebration for them to celebrate year after year so that they could set everything aside. So that as they looked back on 365 days of their outright and open rebellion against God, as they look at the days and the minutes and the seconds of faithlessness and forgetfulness that they have done, they got to celebrate that Passover feast. And be reminded that God's faithfulness is always there. That God never forgets, but always remembers his people. On that day, more than any other, they were there to celebrate this story of deliverance. Of God bringing out his people from the clutches of a heathen hand that had a hold over them. It was on that day that the Lord wanted them to set everything else aside and to remember the Passover. So today, I ask you, and maybe even deeper and more than that, your God asks you, for the rest of this service, for the rest of our time that we have in the house of the Lord, forget it all. Forget the rest of the things that you're going through in life. Forget your schedule, forget your tasks, forget your job, forget your stresses, forget the relationships that are in turmoil, forget the things that you have going on tomorrow, forget everything that you're dealing with out there everything that is clogging up the brain that is in here. Forget it all and remember the Passover lamb. Your God calls you, your God asks you to do that tonight because he knows you need it. He knows that if we consume our brain and our time only with the things of this world, then we will just begin to be more lost and more enslaved than we ever were. For that reason, our Savior gives us this Passover meal. He gives us this Passover feast, his very last will and testament, because his love, his care, his concern for you is that great and is that deep. You know the story of the Passover begins with the story of the Exodus, the Israelites in Egypt, and that goes back even before that, but maybe starting with Joseph, right? Remember that great sin that his own brothers did, that rebellion against him because of their jealousy, selling him off into slavery, their very own brother? Talking about, well, maybe we should kill him now. Let's just sell him down to Egypt. Through their sin, God fulfills a beautiful deed. He uplifts Joseph among even the names of the Egyptians. Said he can have the ear of Pharaoh for a reason. To be a blessing to Egypt. To be a blessing to Israel. Because of the great and tremendous and severe drought and famine that was coming, God spoke through his servant to save lives. To preserve life. And that's exactly what he did. And how did Egypt respond? Out of love and thanks and respect that Joseph and his God could do something so great. They treated him well. They treated his family well. They treated the Israelites as if they were their own. But you know what happened next. That Pharaoh died and his contemporaries died. And they forgot about all the great things that the Israelites had done and instead saw a threat. 
They looked at the masses. They looked at the group of these people that were not their own, that were not Egyptians. And they said, what are they going to do? It's only a matter of time before they get smart enough and they gather together and take us down. So what did the Pharaoh do? For 400 years, he enslaved them. Put shackles and chains on their hands and on their feet mistreated them, beat them, and whipped them, caused them to erect monuments to the false god Pharaoh and to their false gods as well. And in this time, the Lord's people cried out and cried out again, Lord, deliver us. And he heard their cry. He sent his prophet, he sent his servant Moses and his brother Aaron as well with a message to that Pharaoh. It started out, right, with, with let my people go so that they can worship for a period of time in the wilderness. But God knew. God knew where this would ultimately lead. God knew the message that he was sharing with this false God, the king of that earth of that time, when he said, let my people go. And you know how it started. With Moses and Aaron before that Pharaoh, given the instructions by God himself, Aaron, throw out your staff on the ground and it's going to become a snake. That's exactly what happened. And you know what the Egyptian magicians were able to do, right? What Pharaoh's sorcerers were able to do. We don't know how, but they were able to duplicate it and, and copy that miracle. But notice the message that God had for him after that. You know what happened to those snakes? Swallowed up by Aaron's staff. What was the message that God had for the Pharaoh? Our power, your power compared to mine, there is no comparison. I am God and you are not. I have told you to let my people go and that is exactly what I will move you to do. God knew where this was heading. God knew that with every single one of these plagues, Pharaoh's heart would become harder and harder until it would ultimately turn into stone. That, that his face and his heart and his soul would not be turned towards God, but 180 degrees away from him. But that didn't stop God. Because he had made a promise that he would deliver his people. So he sent Moses and Aaron out to the Nile River as the Pharaoh's out there in the cool of the day. And they stretch out that very same staff and what happens? Not just a bit, not just a piece of it, but the entire Nile River turns to blood. And even the vessels that was holding the water that was in that river, in the houses, turned to blood. All of the fish in that river died, every single one of them. Nine plagues that followed this one great plague. Frogs that came out of that river and infested and infected the houses. Gnats that were as numerous as the dust on the ground. Flies that came in swarms. Boils that not only infected the livestock, but also the people. Illnesses that infected the livestock. Gnats so numerous that it would, and locusts that it would blot out the sun. Darkness that God himself said was so dark that you could feel it. All and every single one of these plagues was demonstrating the power of God and was relaying a message to Pharaoh. Let my people go. After those nine plagues, he still didn't do it. He went back on his word time and time again, said that they could go and then brought them back. So God had to do what God would never want to do. God had to do what he knew would be the only means by which he could deliver these people. A plague so severe that it would have to move Pharaoh to release his grasp and hold on these people. So he promised and he spoke that word to Moses that he would bring about a plague against the firstborn of all of Egypt. That on that night at midnight, the angel of death would go through the village and would take the life of every single firstborn son in the family and every single firstborn of the livestock. And God hated to do it, but he had to do it because he had to have his people back. God, in his infinite mercy, had special instructions for the Israelites so that not a son or a daughter, not a firstborn or any kind of sibling would have died that day. It was in our reading for today. 
Go at once and select animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. What did it take for the firstborn in that family, for, for no one in that house to be killed, for everyone to be protected? They did take a lamb, a young lamb, and only a lamb would do. Right? Remember with the rest of the ceremonial laws, if a family didn't have enough money, they could do another substitute, but it had to be a Passover lamb. You, you needed to share with a neighbor. You needed to be a lamb, a young lamb. The pick of the litter, the best of the best, not the throwaway, without blemish and defect and impurity and imperfection. You take that lamb and you kill it. And you drain its blood into the basin and you take a hyssop plant and you paint that blood over all of the door frame. And what is the message that is said on that and through that blood? O angel of death, O destroyer, do not come into this house because a child of God lives here. You know the rest of the story, right? There wasn't a single Israelite firstborn that was killed. There wasn't a single house that had that blood over the doorframe that died. God delivered his people from Egypt. God brought them out. God brought the waters crashing down on Pharaoh and the chariots so that he could deliver his people. For 1,400 years, this Passover meal was celebrated. 1,400 years. Imagine the hundreds of thousands of lambs Imagine the basins of blood. Imagine the death. Imagine the sacrifice over and over again and year after year. And you think about the illustrations and the pictures that are being painted for us. Imagine that last night as an Israelite in Egypt. Imagine your last hours as a slave there. God institutes this meal for them to celebrate and it's not going to be a meal that you'll eat at a three-star Michelin restaurant. It's not the kind of meal that Gordon Ramsay would whoop up or, or you're going to find in the cookbook of Martha Stewart. It did anything but taste good. It wasn't there to fill your belly. It was there to be a reminder. On that night, and in the very last closing hours of their time in slavery, they ate bitter herbs to remind them of, of the bitter slavery, of the daily grind, of the whips, of the hatred of being in that heathen hand. They had unleavened bread because God knew that there wouldn't be time for the yeast to set in and so that it could rise because Pharaoh would cast these people out and then change his mind and want them back. Bitter herbs, the lamb that was fully burnt, the grape wine that was there. 1,400 years later, Jesus was in the upper room celebrating this meal and this feast with his disciples. I'm sure they were talking about and I'm sure they were remembering the wonderful things that God had done to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Egyptians. And then all of a sudden, in an instant, seeming out of nowhere, God did the unthinkable. God took those common items of the Passover feast, this meal just like any other, and made it into the most miraculous feast that anyone can possibly celebrate. He took that unleavened bread and looked at his disciples as he broke it and gave thanks and said, take this and eat this. This is truly and completely and fully my body, which is given for you. And then he took that grape wine, that fruit of the vine, and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, this is not just wine. This is truly and completely and fully my blood that was given for you, the blood of the new covenant that was poured out and shed for the forgiveness of your sins. What? What is Jesus doing here? 
Jesus is showing and demonstrating once and for all that everything about the Passover was a precursor, was a foreshadowing of the deliverance that would come for all the Lord's people. If you pooled together every single droplet of that blood, if you found a, a basin big enough to gather all of that blood, every ounce that was shed of all of the animals, if you collected it and pooled it together and used it and tried to pay for one single sin, it wouldn't be enough. Not even close. Because the blood of animals, the life of an animal, can never pay back the price for sin. Jesus point and reminder that day, only the blood of the Lamb. Only the Passover lamb could do that. And that is exactly what he did. Because we know what happened the very next day. The Passover lamb, without blemish or defect, perfect and righteous and holy in every way, shed every ounce of his blood for all of his people to be delivered. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when your Savior says to you, take and eat, this is my body. The body that he is talking about is the very vessel that he lived in, that he took on flesh in to bring about your salvation. The body that he lived a perfect life in, in your place, and the very body in, that endured hell itself to have you back. And when he's talking about take and drink this blood, the blood that he's talking about is his blood, is the blood that dripped from that crown of thorns over his brow and over his eyes. It's the blood that covered his back and pooled together on the ground as he was whipped and beaten. It's the very blood that gushed out of his wrists and those nails were plunged into them. It's the blood that covered those nails. It's the blood that covered that cross. It's the blood that spilled out as that spear was laid into his side to make sure and assure that he was dead. It's that blood that delivers you. It is that blood only that blood that can deliver you from death. And that's exactly what the Passover lamb does. What Jesus is saying through this meal is that an even greater Passover has taken place. That everything that Passover pointed forward to was and is fulfilled in him. He is the Passover. Think about it, the Egyptians, by God's great things, by the wonderful, miraculous things he had done, by the power that he showed were released from slavery. The shackles and the chains broken off. They were delivered from death itself. They were brought out into the wilderness so that one day they could walk into the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the blood of the Lamb, the shackles and chains that were on your hands and your feet and your heart were broken off. The shackles that held you to slavery in sin itself have been undone. He has not just delivered you from death in this life, but the death of the next life as well. That lamb, that Passover lamb, the way that it was prepared was to be burnt up in full, engulfed in flames. That Passover lamb that hung on a tree for you went through the fires of hell itself so that you would never have to. And that deliverance led them out into the wilderness with a promise that one day they would f walk into the land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey. And you know that this deliverance has guaranteed you a place in that place of promise, the promised paradise with your name on it because of what this lamb and because of what his blood has done for you. If an Israelite ever doubted the depth of God's love for them, all they had to do was look back to the Passover. If you ever doubt, if you ever think, if you ever wonder that your God loves you, remember that he would have sent down 10,000 plagues. He would have done anything possible. He would have done whatever it took to have you back. And that's exactly what he did. That has caused your God to remember your sins no more. 
because he, you are covered with his blood, he no longer sees them. I think that's one of the last things for us to go. For almost all of us, I don't believe it'll ever go away. Is that quick, whip-like memory that we have of all of our sins, of the failures, of the imperfections, of the wickedness things, and the things that we have done in our life. Things that we think about. The words, the actions, the deeds that we just showed our spouse that directly contradicted the promise that we made to them on our wedding day and the oath we made before God. Those words of gossip that we shared with the angry mob that was against the one that you added to the equation just to cut them down all the more. We think of the sins that we did that embarrassed our parents more than we thought we ever could. We think of the sins that have embarrassed us that leads us asking ourselves, how could you ever do such a thing? Brothers and sisters in Christ, we can't remember what we had for lunch the day before, but we remember sins that we did 30 years ago. There are things that we have done that truly tempt us, that truly lead us to ask, is God even great enough to forgive them? Is God's lengths of, and depths of deliverance so great that he could look past, that he could forgive me of something that sick and that severe? Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to assure you of the promise of our Savior. He remembers your sins no more. When he says it, he means it, and it's not an act. How could that be? God knows all things. He knows everything that we've ever done. He knows the history of this world from beginning to end before the, in the beginning even ever happened. So how could God not remember my sins and my failures? Because instead, the Heavenly Father remembers what His Son has done for you. Day after day, He never forgets what the Passover lamb did in your place. He never looks back. He never forgets. He never looks over that blood that was shed in your place. So remember, day after day after day, your sins are washed away. You are forgiven and righteous in God's sight, and heaven is your home might be one of the commonalities between people that struggle with Alzheimer's and dementia. One of the harshest struggles that they go through and, and a question that I believe everyone that goes through that as a Christian comes up at least once or twice in their life. It's a question that, that people have brought to me before and asked me. Pastor, what if I forget? What if in that moment of memory loss I wake up and there's a day that I have forgotten my Savior? What if I woke up and I forget everything that I was trained in and educated in and everything that the Bible says? What if I forget, as I forget myself, what if I forget Jesus and all the wonderful things he has done? Brothers and sisters in Christ, today is a day of remembrance. It's a day for you to remember. But I hope more than anything else, it's a day for you to remember that God will always remember you. When you forget yourself, when you forget who you are, he never will. His name is written on your heart. Your name is written in the book of life. Your sins are washed clean and the blood of the lamb covers over all of you. There's no ounce of memory loss. There's nothing in all of existence that can undo any of that. And I want to assure you that you won't forget. Because I want to assure you in the moments of the deepest memory loss that I have at least witnessed of the Lord's people, there's one thing that they don't forget. They don't forget the Lord's Prayer. They don't forget the creeds. They don't forget John 3.16. They don't forget amazing grace, how sweet the sound. They don't forget their confirmation verse. And ultimately, they don't forget Jesus. Because brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what happens... There's no way that you could ever forget the great things that your Savior has done for you. I hope that every time you enter this house, I hope the hour that you spend in this place of worship is more than anything else the greatest time of your week, a time with the Lord and with his people. But I hope that in that one moment, in that instance, when you get to come to this altar and celebrate the new Passover meal, 
I hope that there is no greater time of your day and in your life than when you come up here with no veil, with no excuses, with no ignorance towards your actions, as you come up here to receive the Lord's Supper as a sinner through and through, admitting all of the things that you have done, laying them at the feet of the cross and opening up your hands and begging for your Savior's mercy. I hope you realize the miracle that takes place as that wafer is placed in that hand. As you hear those words, take and eat. This is the body of Christ that was given for you. As you stretch out those hands and you hear those words, take and drink. This is the blood of Christ. Blood that was shed for you. I hope you remember the Passover. I hope you think back to the deliverance that God showed for his people Israel. But more than anything else, I hope you think of the Passover lamb that was willing to suffer to the greatest degree to have you back. I hope you remember when that cup of wrath was placed before the Son of God himself, that there was nothing else on his mind, that it took no convincing at all, because in that moment with all the pain, with all the punishment, with all the sufferings, with the struggle that was in front of him, in that moment, he remembered you. So that day over day after day, every moment you celebrate this suffer, supper, every time you think of what the Passover lamb has done for you, you get to hear those words. You get to be comforted by that promise that this is his body, which was given for you. This is his blood that was given for you. Promises that we will not ever forget. Promises that we will remember until we take our very last breath. Amen.